documents I'd submitted. By the uh, end of the January meeting, I was able to briefly uh, discuss what I had perceived as systematic inadequacies. Uh, specifically, uh, first, the lack of a formal definition for what actually constitutes operable unit two. I think it's important that that be done not at the end of the rod position, but going into the characterization so that the characterization drives the uh, definition of the, of the area that falls within OU2. And secondly, the absence of a defensible uh, conceptual site model uh, or site conceptual model for the uh, DBI-70 Superfund itself. I observed that without the definition of OU2 that is consistent with both the Superfund program and this Superfund site, scoping the remedial investigation um, is basically meaninglessly chasing one's tail. And without a defensible site conceptual model for the Superfund site as a whole, investigators of OU2 have no technical construct against which to compare any new data that they uh, bring in, uh, i.e. the degree to which the new data, A, um, filled identified data gaps, and B, either confirmed the site conceptual model or exposed error or inadequacies in the site conceptual model that need to be changed. I further observed that the uh, that Denver's technical memorandum on scoping relied upon the original VBI-70 site-wide conceptual model from two decades ago. And if Bridget could move to figure three, there's a uh, diagram and text um, example of what that old conceptual model consisted of. Um, and it's basically the same site conceptual model that is still being used um, by Denver, uh, even though that site conceptual model was proven invalid uh, prior even to the completion of the remedial investigation of operable unit one. Tonight, um, I will move on to problematic data acquisition recommendations and miscellany. Once I summarize these comments, I anticipate a question and answer period on my January comments, uh, written January comments to the CAG. Um, and if time permits, perhaps we can read EPA's observations on those comments and we can explore any uh, issues that result therefrom. Um, <clears throat> the problematic data acquisition recommendations that are in the uh, technical uh, memorandum on scoping correctly identified that the 2009 remedial investigation um, was and is inadequate. The remedial investigation itself considered uh, is considered inadequate in the in the technical memorandum, in part in the light of what has been learned about the site in the years since the original investigation, and it's inadequate in part because aspects of the risk assessment used in 2009 are not consistent with contemporary protocols and standards. Toward providing an adequate um, Remedial investigation, Denver's consultant uh, recommends uh, the installation of 10 additional groundwater monitoring wells and drilling uh, 12 additional soil borings. Now, nine of those soil borings, uh, nine of those borings that are recommended to be drilled for soil samples um, are recommended to be used for the installation of groundwater monitoring wells. Three of the soil samples um, uh, of the borings for soil samples will not be completed as monitoring wells, and one of the new groundwater monitoring wells will be installed in a boring that is not recommended to be sampled for soils. Um, those details are in the in the technical memorandum, and I believe the technical me memorandum or a link to it has been provided by the CAG to uh, 
everybody invited to this meeting. If we can move to slide number four, um, I'd like to discuss um, boring wells and monitoring wells um, and what some of the terminology um, toward them is, is uh, what it might mean visually to you. Um, this is a, a schematic of um, what a cross-section um, at uh, OU2, however one might define it, uh, looks uh, in broad brush strokes relative uh, to where the landfill is and where the the original pit that was dug um, first used for a slag disposal pit um, and then later mined by city and county of Denver after it purchased the land. Um, and then subsequent to mining of the slag uh, used as a municipal dump uh, before the laws of, of RICRA and and uh, regulatory dumping practices. It cut through the various layers of uh, unconsolidated sediment in, in the alluvium of the South Platte River. And those are the, the, the beige background material um, constitutes the municipal dump. Um, the strata layer layering, irregular layering of yellows and oranges and browns represent the various sediments in the in the uh, alluvium, unconsolidated sediments of the South Platte River, and the kind of reddish, burnt brown layer at the bottom is uh, the bedrock of the Denver Formation, um, which underlies the alluvium of the South South Platte River. Within the uh, uniform material, um, schematically uniform, of the dump, there is a sloping um, dark blue line with a couple of triangles on it that uh, represents a potential position of the water table uh, within the dump. Um, the sediments, the dump materials above that line are unsaturated with respect to water. They may be wet, but if you were to try and pump water out of that material, you could not pump water out of it because it is not fully saturated. It is a mix of water and air um, and is water that, or it is would be represent dump materials, wastes that are above the water table. Um, any water, precipitation, snow melt um, that falls on open ground over the dump or on uh, fractured um, uh, uh, asphalt in the, in the parking lot will infiltrate down through that material but it will move vertically uh, through that material until it reaches the water table. The water table marks the boundary between unsaturated or partially saturated uh, soils or wastes. And below that, that blue line, it's shown with the water table symbol, the, the triangles. Um, below that, you're in saturated wastes or saturated soils um, and groundwater uh, within that area does not move vertically. It moves three-dimensionally in response to the, um, to the potential in the groundwater according to Darcy's law. And so there are two entirely different regimes there the water table marks the boundary between uh, Darcyan flow, groundwater flow, 
and what is largely just vertical flow of liquids through the unsaturated materials. Now, below the dark blue line, uh, down near the bottom of the, the uh, landfill, there's another uh, water table shown. That's an alternative position for a water table. Um, the water table in the waste material is going to change depending on where one is looking at it and depending upon where water is coming into the, into the dump and where uh, it is moving out of the dump. It is not at the same elevation. It's not a, necessarily at the same orientation. So if you're drilling to get groundwater in the waste material or in the, the adjacent alluvial materials, depending on where you are, you might find it relatively close to the ground surface. You might find it um, substantially deeper than that. What, what is shown in the middle there is uh, where there is something that goes vertically through the, the waste is a, a drill hole or a boring that is put and drilled through the through the <clears throat> through the waste material, or if it's advanced outside the boundaries of the landfill, it would be drilled through the alluvial sediments. Um, and a boring is just a hole that's put through there. Um, it's it's often used to get to a point where you collect samples. Uh, of the sediment or the waste that you're drilling through. Um, the hole can also be used to uh, install a well. And in the uh, shallow portion of that, um, of that uh, boring that interrupts the, or is drawn to show a digging out of the waste materials, um, is a, a well that is installed um, to uh, allow sampling of the water at the water table if the water table is, is at the position that it's drawn. Um, the dotted lines, uh, the, well, the well itself is a pipe that's put in the ground um, and is identified by solid lines with the exception of at the bottom, there is an interval um, represented by dotted lines that is what is called the screened interval or the perforated interval of the pipe that constitutes the well. Um, that is where the pipe is not solid, but is perforated or slotted to allow water from at or below the water table to enter the well. And at that point, the well can be used to sample uh, the water table water or also to measure the elevation or the potential um, of the uh, water table at the location of the well. Above that perforated interval, the <clears throat> the open space between the pipe of the well and the formation uh, at the edge of the boring is filled with a, a impermeable material to prevent water running down the sides of the pipe in the, in the open space or the annulus between the well and the formation. And then there is a second pipe or casing that's put in um, to, uh, to protect the top of the well itself and to uh, put a cap on it so that it gets protected and rain doesn't enter the top of the well. So that's a configuration of a well if the, uh, if the water table is shallow like that if the water table is uh, deeper than the well is deeper, and I'm showing a deeper well that's 
kind of ghosted in in a gray with a screen that is positioned in the second case, again, at the water table, but is much deeper from, from land surface. So when we talk about screening and depths of sampling, um, that may give you kind of a, a visual um, understanding of, of what's involved. Um, the water table within the waste mass uh, extends uh, into the unconsolidated sediments. Um, and so it, what you find um, if you're drilling uh, adjacent or completely outside of um, the waste material may be influenced by the uh, leachate within the landfill if as uh, the blank arrow on the right is there. Similarly, something that is uh, below the water table and below the landfill um, may similarly be uh, influenced by the leachate in the, in the, uh, in the land. I, I shouldn't call it a landfill because that implies a degree of engineering to it. This, this was an open pit dump, um, but the sediments below that dump may be influenced by the leachate in the dump, depending upon what direction uh, the water uh, is moving um, below the water table. Um, also shown on here are uh, the sample intervals that are proposed in the uh, technical memorandum. A sample um, taken uh, within the first two feet below ground surface, a sample to be taken approximately five feet below the ground surface, and a sample to be taken just above the water table. Um, and so if it's a shallow water table, uh, it will be a shallow sample. If it's a deep water table, it will be a deep sample that is taken. All right, so with that to kind of help um, uh, help you with uh, uh, visualizing some of what I'm going to discuss, um, I'll continue on. Um, one problem for me with the technical memorandum is that uh, in the recommendations, Denver's technical memorandum is not explicit on the precise uh, data purposes for each of the recommended additional elements. Um, that is, uh, what data is actually needed, uh, why the investigation is deficient without that data at that point, and how the new data will be used uh, to alleviate the inadequacies that, that uh, Denver's consultant sees. Uh, with respect to groundwater sampling, um, it's my opinion that Denver should demonstrate that locating a groundwater well um, uh, for multiple purposes um, or, or using a groundwater well or boring for multiple purposes as they're doing, they're putting borings in for um, uh, vapor intrusion, geologic data information, uh, hopefully uh, landfill waste information, although they don't indicate that, uh, soil chemistry, groundwater chemistry, uh, but that locating a single feature for multiple purposes does not compromise optimally locating for instance, a well for purposes of groundwater monitoring. Um, at the same time, it's optimally locating that well for each of the other characterization purposes, or else I think it needs to modify the technical memorandum so that boring, boring for soil identification, soil chemistry, uh, soil materials, waste materials, is each independently opt optimally located 
Um, if, if it can't be shown a single location is optimal for multiple purposes, then there should be, there should be multiple locations. Um, CCOD recommends that each well be completed at uh, the well be completed at the water table. Um, and, and with a screen big enough that if the water table moves with time uh, seasonally, for example, that, that you're still uh, always uh, sampling the water table. Um, I think Denver should demonstrate how it is sufficient to characterize a complex groundwater system uh, in terms of either quality or potentiometric surface or potential of the groundwater um, only at the depth of the water table. Um, it, it, it is a important surface. It is an important chemical boundary, um, the boundary between uh, saturated and unsaturated rock, and therefore influence from infiltrating uh, atmospheric gases or ex extrusion of dissolved gases. But it is not the only important uh, chemistry and potential in a groundwater system um, unless there's some reason that Denver can demonstrate that that it's that, that is is sufficient and they do not offer that demonstration um, and it would be a unique setting in my experience for it to be uh, sufficient to sample only at the water table and everywhere at the water table. Uh, Denver recommends sampling each monitoring location uh, once every three months, um, quarterly, um, and for a single year. Uh, I think Denver, with that limited a sampling uh, proposal, uh, should demonstrate how groundwater data uh, on a quarterly basis, which does not reflect known variability in the hydrologic system, can adequately serve uh, Denver's characterization needs. Uh, or if it can't do that, it needs to modify its technical memorandum. Um, groundwaters are sensitive to changes in the hydrologic system through which they flow. To be complete, Denver must characterize where the new flow patterns that exist now um, at the site compared to the flow patterns prior to the outflow construction and changes, um, where the new patterns are generating new water chemistries by virtue largely uh, potentially of repositioning the water table within the wastes, but also changing the flow patterns through the wastes and from the wastes into the surrounding sediments, how fast those changes are occurring and what will become the new normal once the new flow system is had a chance to, to impress its chemical changes. Uh, CCOD should demonstrate how that characterization can be a changed, can be achieved um, with quarterly monitoring for a single year um, or absent that demonstration, um, it needs to modify its technical memorandum. Denver recommends that the groundwater samples be collected using standard low flow sampling methodologies. Um, that being the recommendation, Denver needs to be able to demonstrate with specificity how it will be able to produce comparable samples among each of the uh, monitoring wells at this site in these variable materials using the low flow methodology, or it needs to go back and modify the technical memorandum. 
city and county of Denver should also demonstrate how the water being collected and analyzed um, is relevant to what needs to be known at the site um, or modify the technical memorandum to make sure that um, each and every one of those uh, sampling points is relevant to what the site characterization is needed. Um, the, the low flow sampling methodology um, is decades old at this point. It's often used because it's cheaper and faster uh, than traditional methods of purging all water from wells. Uh, it produces a benefit of less wastewater that has to be disposed of, but it's uh, experienced in the last two and a half or three decades um, and uh, research through the decades has shown it's, it's, it's tough to use low flow uh, and get meaningful data uh, consistently, um, particularly in the, in the case of um, water table samples and collecting uh, collecting water from a moving moving surface at different times of sampling, and this needs to be uh, discussed and justified on the part of the uh, Denver. Denver and, and soil sampling, Denver recommends three discrete soil samples um, from each of the eight uh, soil borings that are uh, within the outline they have now of, of OU2, one from within the shallowest two feet, one from soils penetrated uh, somewhere between two and seven feet below the surface, around five feet, um, and the third sample from immediately above the water table um, at the location of each boring. Um, outside the bound, their boundary of OU2, um, they don't really have, uh, it, it says the samples may be adjusted. Um, there's no explanation as to why there are the three samples. Um, at those depths. Um, there is no discussion of how that the material uh, for that discrete sample is going to be selected, what is going to um, cause one piece of the core or the drilled soils to be sampled as opposed to one immediately above or below it, um, what the criteria are going to be, what it is that is being sought in that sampling. Um, Denver should be required to demonstrate why it is appropriate to sample soils uh, beyond the two shallow samples at depths only just above the water table. Um, even in borings, that may extend below the water table, um, particularly when the wastes of a municipal dump extend to depths below the water table and water table necessarily flows through materials below the water table. Um, in, in the schematic on slide four, um, if it's a shallow water table, you're looking at wastes uh, being sampled three times in um, in the shallow part of of the waste pile or the landfill. Um, if the water table is deep within the landfill, there's a huge mass of waste between the five foot sample and the water table near the bottom of the waste that is being penetrated, um, but is not being sampled. And I think that needs to be explained. The other aspect is, that is not clear in this, is if the water table is 
um, is encountered at say 15 feet, but there is 40 feet of waste in the landfill, um, it is not clear that a boring at that location to characterize soil or waste composition is going to be extended below the water table to look at what that waste looks like or whether because the water table has been encountered and right now there's no proposed sampling of deeper water that there also will be no sampling uh, deeper um, in the waste uh, below the water table or whether all characterization is going to be of the unsaturated zone and water chemistry at the water table. And that needs to be clarified. Um, and if there is not an intent uh, to sample waste or soils below the water table, um, that needs to be corrected. Um, CCOD uh, Denver should provide a discussion of the depths to which the three new soil borings will be drilled in locations where there are not going to be water table or monitoring wells installed, i.e. are they going to be similarly shallow um, and above the water table and just no well is installed? Are they going to be uh, to the depth of the waste? Are they going to be in sediment adjacent to the landfill to a depth that would be equivalent to the bottom of the, of the uh, dump? Um, all of this is, is, uh, is undiscussed and should be discussed and uh, the technical memorandum should be, should be modified. Um, all right, so that's the specific elements that they're proposing and things that create problems for me. Under miscellany, the first of three is uranium and thorium testing. Um, Denver's technical memorandum includes a, an attachment four on uranium and thorium background concentrations. Um, it does discuss that, that four of six groundwater samples from OU2 uh, were analyzed for uranium, and four of the six equaled or exceeded the screening level of 30 micrograms per liter. Um, the other two uh, that did not exceed that level were respectively at 29, 28 and 29. So the four samples for uranium um, all were, were virtually at or uh, above. Uh, two were were minimally below. So there is mobile uranium um, where it's been sampled on OU2. Um, the, uh, the location of those samplings on OU2, whether they were within the landfill or outside the landfill, um, do not, um, are not uh, discussed in attachment four. Um, Denver relied almost entirely upon a single USGS publication, Circular 1357, um, to conclude that it's unnecessary to do any more monitoring for uranium. A review of that, that uh, circular actually uh, indicates that uh, to the extent that it, any of the information in that circular is relevant, it supports the need for monitoring of uranium. Um, and not just in the groundwater. All of the data in the circular um, are from wells that are more than 10 miles away from OU2. Uh, the relevant parts of uh, 2OU2 of the circular are the discussions of the chemical controls of uranium mobility in groundwater. And that is relevant because the circular points out that oxygen is extremely important in the mobility of uranium in water. The higher the oxygen content, the more oxic the water, the more easily uranium that is sequestered on or in the minerals of the soil uh, dissolves into the groundwater. 
less oxic, i.e. more anoxic, the aquifer setting, the less likely the uranium will move from the soils, from the waste, into the passing groundwater. Now, this is important at OU2 because the waste in OU2 in Denver's uh, municipal dump um, is, and, and my concern is uh, the waste that's in the dump and not native sediments. At present, large portions of the dump are strongly reducing anoxic. Um, it is characteristic. Uh, I mean, it, it's characterized both by measurements, but also indirect things like the production of methane, um, putrescent wastes that are rotting. Uh, what we know about the wastes in there indicates that it's, it's anoxic. There is little oxygen available. And um, therefore, uranium that is present under existing conditions is going to largely remain with the waste and with the sediment. Groundwater with dissolved uranium in that groundwater, which moves into OU2 and through the anoxic waste dumps, will likely precipitate or absorb that uranium coming in uh, into or onto dump wastes, essentially chemically filtering the passing water of uranium, but at the same time concentrating that uranium in the waste dumps. Um, because all because the anoxic conditions that currently exist in the old dump, um, uranium mill tailings any uranium mill tailings that might be in there will still likely be sequestering uh, uranium. But if and when putrescent or other oxygen organic rich wastes have totally decomposed or are dug out and removed, and when site or when site construction changes and drops the water table, um, introducing oxic conditions, then any uranium within those sediments and those wastes, as described in Circular 1357, will uh, no longer be sequestered and will tend to move. CCD should monitor um, for uranium as part of the characterization and should also monitor the contents, analyze the contents, um, for potential uranium in the wastes because one of the problems they now acknowledge for this is the uh, migration of gaseous contaminants out of the wastes and potentially into buildings that may be put on this, this land. Any uranium that is currently sequestered in the various wastes of Denver's dump creates uh, a problem that Denver is not addressing. Radon is a daughter product of uranium decay. Um, Denver is very well familiar with radon migration and poisoning from uh, uranium bearing wastes across the city um, uh, and the history and the problems that that has created. Even if anoxic conditions persist and uranium remains immobile in the solid phase, radon will be off-gassing from any uranium sequestered in the dump. CCOD should add radon to the list of contaminants that is part of its vapor intrusion investigations and should monitor for that. The next thing that falls under um, Miscellany is uh, what I believe is a clear Clean Water Act violation. Um, groundwater flows through the wastes in the municipal dump. By definition, ground or surface water that contacts waste is leachate. Prior to Globeville Landing out project, Outfall Project, that le <coughs> leachate migrated <coughs> overwhelmingly northwestward Excuse me for a minute. 
<coughs> northwestward from the dump <coughs> to the South Platte River, intersecting the river somewhere north of I-70. <coughs> Denver's Glop, Glenville, <coughs> Globeville Landing Outfall Project, constructed a drainage channel from the adjacent South Platte River to the discharge drop structure for the new stormwater outflow. That channel excavated through a bank of low permeability, floodplain silts and clays, and into the gravel pit excavation that was once the smelter slag and is now the Denver dump. <clears throat> Leachate that previously flowed from the dump through natural materials to the South Platte River, well north, uh, well to the north, now drains through the constructed channel directly into the South Platte River. Um, and I believe this leachate discharge is unambiguously a discharge that requires a Clean Water Act permit. CCD knows of the discharge. <clears throat> Denver's Globeville Landing outflow outflow project designed around the leachate problem to construct a channel by cutting off leachate flow with temporary pile walls until the channel and the drop, drop structure were completed. If Bridget can move to uh, slide five, uh, this is a uh, aerial photo of the uh, of the O2, <coughs> O2 area um, and the um, and the uh, uh, global landing discharge structure. Um, you can see the Coliseum I-70. Um, there is a tan uh, worm, if you will. It sort of looks like a flatworm. To the left side, uh, southwest of the of the Antha, or the Coliseum, um, that is the open flow channel of the um, of the landing, um, just as a, a way of or orienting you. Um, if you move, uh, and this image was taken on uh, May 13th of uh, 2018. So this is well into nearing the completion of the structure or the outflow landing. If we move to slide six, we zoom in on that tan uh, flatworm and you can see it is the open channel area. At the upper right, there is a outflow from the um, northern uh, stormwater discharge into this um, uh, into this open channel, and to the south is the uh, discharge galleries from the um, from the storm drainage that comes in under the Pepsi Center. Um, uh, you will note that that um, the south entrance to the drops or to the Globeville landing structure um, does have water uh, flowing into it or flowing from the discharge galleries, but that is flowing uh, through the open channel of the old outlet. So it has not yet been diverted into the new uh, Globeville Landing outflow, um, but it is still flowing through its previous uh, outfall to the South Platte River. Um, there is no flow through the South Channel. There is standing water at a couple of places in the North Channel, but there is no stormwater flow and uh, from either the north or the south. And between the, the two no stormwater flow arrows and adjacent to the white sidewalk that marks the western boundary, um, 
there is a white triangle um, that marks the flow of the channels um, into the drop structure. There it goes into the constructed drop structure that has the park built on top of it. And it uh, comes out a uh, the drop flow structure at the tail of the blue arrow that says leachate flow. On this day, uh, April 13th, 2018, no water is flowing into that drop structure, yet the uh, stilling pond and the uh, drainage in the constructed channel uh, from there to the South Flat River is conveying water. That water is leachate um, that is flowing, entering the, the channel from the bottom as base flow and is providing drainage um, from the landfill into the South Flat River um, at that point. Um, <clears throat> So during construction, CCD Denver knew this was going to be happening. It was observable while construction was going on. Um, Denver sealed the banks of the channel with grouted uh, walls to prevent visible bank leakage and flow into the channel. But it saw the channel flow um, before any um, base flow or before any stormwater was put through the drop structure. Um, I was on site and saw the same conditions existed in August of 2018. No flow into the drop structure, but flow through the channel into the South Platte River. Um, the Denver's consultant uh, did groundwater model, uh, groundwater flow modeling during construction. Those models showed that there would be discharge from the landfill into the channel. Um, and Google Earth photographs showed it. Uh, Subsequently, in late August, early September of 2018, uh, Denver opened the drop structure to stormwater flow. And uh, if we go to figure seven, this is a analogous picture to figure six, except now the open channels show water flowing through the channels, the vegetation is in place. Um, the open flow, uh, stormwater flow, is flowing through the open channels, goes into the drop structure under the park and comes out at the head of the constructed channel where it now flows, stormwater now flows, mixing with uh, leachate that would be coming up um, through the bottom of that channel and again, emptying directly into the South Platte River. Um, Denver's uh, technical memorandum makes no mention of this off-site transport and discharge of leachate um, from Denver's dump uh, at, that's within OU2. Uh, Denver's technical memorandum provides no means uh, and proposes no means to characterize the off-site transport and discharge of leachate. CC uh, Denver should be uh, required to develop a characterization plan to document the discharge of leachate um, with respect to its quantity, its quality, and its variability. Doing this, characterizing that leachate, is neither exotic nor difficult. Um, uh, there are a number of ways to do it. Um, and one of which I was readily observed last, uh, last Sunday. Uh, temperatures drop below zero. Um, 
the what limited, very limited flow uh, occurred um, through the open channels uh, was very minimum. Things were frozen tight. Um, there was virtually, except right at the outflows, there was no uh, there was no visible surface flow until you got to where uh, the flow entered the drop structure. Um, but when you went down to the channel um, below the drop structure, uh, the flow in that channel was absolutely open flow, no ice, not even on the banks. It was it was devoid of the ice that was sealing up the surface flow above the drop structure. The reason for that is that the groundwater feeding into the bottom of that channel was sufficiently warm that the uh, ice did not form and you had uh, ice-free flow uh, through comparable channel structures as existed above the structure. In other words, you don't even have to use chemistry to document this flow. You can use heat and thermal uh, thermal balancing um, to determine the quantity of that flow. Now, it doesn't tell you anything about the chemistry of the flow, but it gives you a measure of um, the volume of that flow on a given day. Um, but there are also chemical ways and, and subsurface characterizations that would allow one to monitor that. Um, independently of the Superfund program, uh, Denver should um, be applying for a Clean Water Act permit for that leachate discharge into the South Platte River. Uh, the financial threat to the taxpayers of Denver I being one is too great to allow this to continue day after day for years without a permit. Um, and lastly, in, in miscellany is South Platte River discharge um, along the banks of the South Platte River. Uh, this, uh, an arrow points to the area of the um, uh, of the bank at Goldville Park, where substantial water is migrating um, out of the bank, uh, the sides of the bank, uh, and at the toe of the bank um, into the South Platte River. Um, it's a multitude of seeps and springs. Um, there are a couple of uh, of culverts that are emptying into the South Platte along that interval. Um, it's not acknowledged in the technical memorandum. It's not discussed. Uh, Denver should revise its technical memorandum to characterize um, the source of this water, the quantity of the water, and the quality of that discharge. It should also revise its technical memorandum on scoping to add characterization of the soils across which this discharge is occurring, uh, particularly to establish the degree of which, if any, uh, contaminants uh, in that groundwater discharge are accumulating due to evaporation, oxidation, absorption, uh, other methods of sequestration of contaminants in the groundwater at that point, uh, sequestering that at the groundwater surface water interface. Um, this sequestration of contaminants was documented in, uh, in the examination of the old uh, Globeville Landing Park in places where there were seeps and springs where uh, uh, lead and or arsenic, I forget whether it was one or both, um, were developing in the soils at the positions of those leachates 
and it's it's a a location of um, buildup of contaminants that is well recognized uh, in the literature. And if that water coming out that new bank um, is doing that, um, it needs to be known in order to to manage that site safely in the future. So those are my thoughts. Uh, I think it probably appropriate to um, take a break, maybe answer questions. And if we get through the questions, we can uh, move on to, to perhaps discussing uh, EPA's uh, comments late last week, middle of last week regarding uh, my observations. Uh, Brent, you had a question on number four. Uh, if people want to look at the chat, there are a couple of questions that you can see. And then um, I guess, Chuck, we have to read those to you, right? That would be correct. Okay, so the first question was, uh, what color or region represents the waste mass? And that was on slide number four. Slide number four is the, the part that is a beige color or a tan color with no detail in it um, in the bulk of the middle of that diagram. Okay, Bridget, can you give us four? Can you put yes. four up so we can look at it? Let's see. Oops, questions. It's up. Okay. Where is the waste site? Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I guess basically the whole, like the majority of this picture is showing the waste mass. That's why I couldn't find it. Right, right. The waste, the waste here is, is the entire central portion of the um, it there is a little bit of adjacent thing shown next to it, but it it is the amorphous blob in in the middle of this picture. Okay, does that help, Brent? Yes, very much. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Adrian. What is the rate of flow of groundwater, and how far out are sampling wells, Chuck? <clears throat> All right. We do not know the rate of groundwater flow because the existing conditions have not been uh, really characterized since the outflow, uh, the stormwater outflow structure was built. And that materially changed um, the flow patterns. And those have, have yet to be uh, adequately redefined and redetermined, and hopefully uh, a, a characterization for the remedial investigation will will produce that information. Um, the present uh, the present monitoring that is proposed. Uh, well, actually, the the. The, mono, the groundwater flow patterns that were interpreted from the wells prior to the reconstruction of the site um, were essentially at the perimeter of the site, uh, assuming that the flow was strictly um, uh, from the upgradient wells to the downgradient wells without any uh, perturbations or changes in directions, and that projected the flow of groundwater uh, through this dump and through the O2, uh, OU2 uh, area would be to the northwest and would intersect the uh, South Platte River somewhere north of um, 
north of I-70. It would flow under I-70 and and intercept, uh, join the river, uh, provide base flow to the river north of north of I-70. The flow rate um, uh, was not determined in the. Um, uh, I don't recall that it was determined in the original remedial investigation, um, but the uh, if there were a number that had been put to it, it would almost certainly have been uh, far too slow um, based upon uh, the data that was available at the time of the 2009 remedial investigation and what was learned since then about the flow rates and the volumes of groundwater flow uh, during the construction of, of the outfall. Um, but basically that's a very big unknown and that is clearly something that does have to be established in the revised remedial investigation. Okay, uh, does that help Adrian? Okay, he's not on. Okay, Joan. Yeah, that. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chuck. That does that does answer my question. Thank okay. you. And Joan has a question. What type of permit should be issued? What would you suggest, Chuck? Surface. What contaminants would be identified? Well, the the contaminants that would need to be in the permit are the contaminants that are in the leachate in the landfill. Um, so we need to get start getting water quality samples from the groundwater from the leachate within the landfill. Um, I think it would be just a, a I'm, I'm not a, uh, I don't know how many different kinds of Clean Water Act permits there are, but I would assume it would be whatever the permit uh, that is needed for uh, discharging a, uh, a leachate um, from a, a constructed conveyance. I would think it would be the same sort of permit that would it would be apl applicable if they had constructed a, a uh, culvert drain to the landfill. Is that something, Chuck, that we need to take an action on? That we can request uh, what the contaminants are? And do we need to do something about the permit? Um, well, the permitting requirements are um, managed by CDPHE. Um, and actually, uh, it's, it's interesting that to a degree, uh, I want to um, The EPA's response that they sent you or observations that they uh, sent you this week uh, addresses my concern about this being a Clean Water Act um, permitting situation. Uh, the EPA's only comment about it um, is a similar situation arose during the removal work. That matter was managed and resolved by CDPHE. You can ask Fonda for a contact in CDPHE that can help you understand the matter. Okay. So I, I'm guessing that uh, they are drawing a uh, analogy to the permitting of produced water during construction 
um, which was resolved by a conclusion it could not be discharged to the South Platte River uh, without management, without permitting. Um, and at that point, it was resolved by uh, processing the water and discharging it to the South Platte River by permit. Now, discharging by that, discharging treated water by a permit would be different than what this is. Um, but, but it is something that, uh, you know, th this is just un, un, unmonitored and untreated discharge. Um, so it isn't, uh, really a similar situation uh, to my thinking, So what but we, yeah, we probably need then to, uh, talk to somebody on that permit situation and figure out what needs to be done so we can make that recommendation to Denver, right? Well, certainly it, it needs to be done. Uh, it's my way of thinking. I don't think anybody um, should, be, should be discharging under the conditions that Denver is discharging now. Whether it is a a super fund issue or it is um, a lawsuit issue or I mean I, I don't know how you deal with something uh, of this of this nature. Um, I think it certainly is a super fund issue to be establishing how many gallons a minute of what composition of water is leaving the Superfund site, uh, leaving OU2, um, but where, where getting a Clean Water Act permit uh, meshes in with um, Superfund law and statutes, I, I really don't know how to advise you on that, Fred. Okay, well, I think we can possibly do a little research on that and see what we have to do. Um, another question, how many surface acres does this mass cover? Do you have any idea? Oh, it's, it's probably described in the technical memorandum. Um, it, it's a little complicated because I think under the, under the new mapping that is suggested in the technical memorandum that unlike the original remedial investigation, it looks to me like they are saying that, that some of this fill uh, actually extends contiguously off the site up toward the, the, uh, the Western Stock Show area but that may not all be municipal waste um, because I don't think there's a lot of characterization of it yet. But, uh, need to and, I, and I don't recall off the top of my head how many tens of acres it, it is, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in the tens of acres. Okay, thank you. Um, we are at seven o'clock right now. And the agenda, I believe we were going to do some, a report from CDPHE at seven. Was that right, Bridget? Yes, I just wanna make sure we have all our questions. I think we just have one more question. Okay, um, we have an assignment for Chuck. Right, what, what chemicals may be evaporating? Um, what I'm asking you is for a list of kinds of actions we can plan for at the March meeting. So this is your homework between now and the next time we meet, uh, next time the CAG meets as such, okay? Can we ask you, to, can I ask you to do that? <laughs> yeah, just, just order it. <laughs> anyway, 
Okay, um, one last question from Joan. What chemicals may be evaporating and why do we go to CDPA? And why what? Why do we go, why are we going to CDPHE for a permit? I believe that's what it is. Well, CDPHE, uh, I believe, is the designated authority for enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Okay. Okay. That yeah. would be why. Okay. And as far as what what uh, what compounds are of concern uh, in terms of vapor. Um, uh, vapor migration from these wastes uh, through the unsaturated zone, um, that is part of what this characterization is um, is designed, is as, as laid out in the technical memorandum, they will be uh, testing based on uh, water quality values and uh, sediment characteristics and that sort of thing, um, the vapor intrusion uh, potential and risks for which compounds. Um, but that, that was not part of the original RI, um, and uh, so that's part of what the characterization, the new monitoring, monitoring points are um, asserted as being put in to do is to provide some of that data. Okay. And I thought you said something about radon evaporating. There was a, a radon thing that would be a problem if they put up a new building, right? Well, to the extent that there may be um, uh, uranium yes. in that dump. Yes. Uh, and it would not be particularly, we wouldn't know that particularly based on the amount of uranium in the groundwater because the chemistry of that waste is such that the uranium is not really going to dissolve in groundwater as long as, as long as it is oxygen depleted. So if there's, if there's uranium in there, it's it's groundwater is not a good way to detect it, but if it's in there, it will be producing radon, and that radon will migrate to the water table, and then migrate through the unsaturated zone. So the soil in there, the wastes in that landfill, need to be uh, assessed with respect to looking for uranium, not just ignoring and saying it's unnecessary. But radon, uh, because there could be uranium in there, radon should be on the list of contaminants that the, um, the vapor intrusion uh, considers in terms of assessing what what people living on and above this should be. It, we don't have, it should not be eliminated from the contamination uh, assessment uh, based on the data that we have now. Um, I would also guess that there could be methane evaporating. Is oh, very much. Yeah. Methane, methane's on, on the list of of uh, uh, vapor extrusion or vapor intrusion, yes. um, the the site is known known to produce methane. Yeah, Chuck, I have two two quick questions. Is Denver going to actually identify all of the pollutants they find as they do their well testing? And are the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for cleaning this up, or is it possible to identify? The polluters through the uh, contamination. I'm. I would be astounded if in this site there was any way to 
tie any particular contaminant to any particular person that may have dumped um, in here. I think this is this is uh, this is a site we own, Bridget. <laughs> And is Denver going to identify the pollutants that they find in the water in the site when they dig these wells? Chuck? I would like to see a work plan put in place for um, for the RI that makes it clear Denver does have to identify um, what's in this waste, not just above the water table, but below the water table and uh, throughout the site. Uh, that will be one thing I will be arguing for and commenting upon. Uh, based upon um, what I have seen, uh, at this site in the past, uh, I don't hold out a lot of hope that it will be characterized correctly. I think that it is a little after seven. Bridget, can you help us with the agenda? Where are we supposed to be right now? Mute, Thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much for that incredible analysis. It was um, a little bit much for some of us to get through, but very, very necessary. And for all the hard work that you put into it and for your, all of your efforts on our behalf, thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Yes. De todos. So, okay. um, at this point, I thought we were supposed to hear from CD. But we just have to click through. Okay. There we are. Yeah. Okay. EPA Region 8, are they here to give a, a report? Anyone here from EPA? Going, going, gone. All right. CDPHG, you wanted to give a report? Hey, Fran. This is Chris Wardell with EPA. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, Chris, what's up? Can we see so, Chris, can we see you? I'm not right now because I'm working on kids' bedtime as well. So no. Um, <laughs> hey, Jesse, can you hold on for just a minute? I just I have just two quick things I want to uh, announce tonight. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Chris Wardell. Um, I'm the section chief for the committee committee involvement section for Region 8. Uh, the first announcement is starting March 1. There will be a new community involvement coordinator assigned to this site. His name is Ryan Cloberdans, um, and he will attend the uh, March, I forget, I think it's the March 16th meeting as well. Um, and so he'll start March 1st as Jennifer Chergo is transitioning off the site and she is retiring um, early this year. Okay. Um, the other announcement as well, I just wanted to bring up to Fran, um, I know that Betsy has reached out to you a few times wanting to meet to discuss this keg going forward and kind of the keg enhancements that EPA and CDPHE have been discussing and just want to encourage you to take that meeting going forward and that um, our acting regional administrator, uh, Deb Thomas, um, there might be a letter from her to the keg to encourage that meeting and kind of, kind of holistically kind of figure out the best way we can engage with this keg, not just on super fund issues, but I know there's a lot of issues that have been brought up in the past that are outside the realm of super fund, um, but that are, you know, valid, you know, environmental justice and community concerns as well, and kind of discuss the new or potential kind of uh, Northeast Denver Commerce City environmental forum that we've been kicking around. So just wanted to get your ideas on that going forward. So okay, I those are the two announcements that I wanted to make. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'm out there. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I will do that February contact that I know we put it off till February, and the days have gone by so fast. Here we are again. Yeah, they, they do. So yes. I hear you on that. Okay, so, thanks, Chris. And appreciate everyone's uh, attendance tonight, and uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you, too, for being here.
Um, we're going to hear from Jesse Aviles, por favor. Hello, so um, it's a quick, I guess a quick correction and then a question. Uh, Brent, you're the new one. O VBI 70, it's only two OUs now. OU1 was the residential portion that was deleted um, about a little more than a year ago. So uh, there's no more actions need to take, need to be taken at that area. Um, and then the question is, it's mostly for you. Um, there is, you know, Chuck gave his presentation and I sent you a response. So I think that if more than anything, it would be, if you have any questions about those, um, you know, I'm here. <sighs> Chuck? Anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was uh, <laughs> muted and didn't realize it. Uh, Jesse, I only just got the comments you had back. Um, they're brief, but in some cases, they're somewhat confusing to me. Um, I'm going to have to take some time to look at them, and I would prefer to respond or comment on them at least, but not necessarily respond, uh, comment on them in writing so that uh, both you and the CAG uh, have a, a permanent permanent copy of what I've got to say. Okay. Um, a couple of things, Chuck. Um, you keep you keep showing the old CSM for the site. The new CSM for the site is in page 142, 43, 44, and 45 of the scope. And they're much more comprehensive than the one that you're showing. The permit or the clean water permit portion, uh, what is similar is that in during the removal, there was also mention of the seeps and discharge of leachate from the side to the river, and that was addressed by CDPHG. So it was not the construction water that we're talking about. Um, for the part of the presentation that you did last time, most of that it's it's with the idea that slag was transferred across Denver, and that was a similar discussion to what we had during the deletion of OU1, and so the larger explanation i referred to the answer that it's already in place for the deletion um and what else on oh, the uranium um the uranium is also managed on the idea that there was disposal of, of radioactive waste at the site and and there's no indication that that happened so those are the couple of things that may help you understand where i'm coming from okay um thank you okay uh, Janine, the, where is the more current CSM? It's in the scope, in the draft scope. It's um, H142, it's five of them. So that's where you find them. Um, I Can you translate CEM, please? CSM, Conceptual Site Model. Oh, CSM, yes. I have yes. said it wrong. All right, yep. Conceptual Site. Conceptual site. Site model. Model. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Is there anything else we need to take care of? CDPHE. Anyone else from CDPHE? Thank you, uh, Jesse. I just didn't catch where you said that that the uh, the current more current or updated uh, CSM was. So I appreciate the information. Um, so I'm representing uh, CDPHG tonight, I guess. I've got my armor on. So I just wanted you to know that it, we didn't know until today that you expected someone from uh, Water Quality Control Division here. Um, and so what I'd like to suggest is that we, um, that you, you come, that you <laughs> develop what it is you're asking. I've taken some notes. Um, but I don't count on my notes um, to necessarily answer uh, or to, to fill in for you know what you are desiring. I know you're thinking that there is a, there was a permit, there should be a permit that nobody's looking at the untreated leachate. Um, so what I would recommend, and if you're thinking you want that person, someone from Water Quality Control Division to 
uh, attend the next meeting in March. If you could get them to us at least two weeks before, get them to me and then I will run them up the flagpole um, to see who would be the appropriate person to discuss. Them. Thank you, Janine. Sure. I have a question. Sure. Joan, go ahead. Um, Janine, if this is leachate that is under the Superfund site, wouldn't that be EPA dealing with leachate? This is not surface water runoff that CDPHE would um, permit, et cetera. Is that correct? Leachate is a little different animal. And if Chuck is saying we have some uranium issues, um, whether it um, that's being found. But what I'm saying is, this is isn't this an EPA issue if this has to do with leachate? And I'm looking at sites that are continually referencing that EPA um, does a characterization of the leachate, not CDPHE. So what I'm hearing is um, that because this is in the Superfund footprint, and we're talking about the amount of sampling and the determination of what might actually be discharging to state waters, um, it, there could be a nexus here, just like there was in the construction of the Globeville Landing Project. Um, so, and by nexus, I mean there's a meeting of what's, what's EPA's responsibility, what is the city and county of Denver's responsibility, either because they're a PRP at, at the Superfund site or because this is their closed landfill. So, so is it landfill, Janine, I apologize. I really apologize for this. Is the landfill itself considered Superfund or is the landfill just in a Superfund site? And Chuck has identified that there are constituents that are coming out of Denver's landfill. And so I think that's my question. Is this landfill considered a super part of, is it just included in the Superfund site, but it is not considered a Superfund landfill with enough hazardous constituents that could be um, creating leachate that's um, said to be discharging to the South Platte. So I think that's the question. Is that landfill a Superfund site? There has been testing and sampling with EMSI so that's why I'm confused. And we've had an email from Jennifer Trigo at some point that also made that statement that the landfill is considered in the, in the Superfund site, but the actual Superfund site's under Pepsi and uh, et cetera. So, I mean, we have never discussed about all the contamination that's potentially under Pepsi and whether any of that is um, having any impact on discharge or leachate, et cetera? So it's difficult, I know, and it uh, can seem very daunting and complicated at times, but basically what we have to do is figure out where the, where did the co contamination come from? Superfund it has its mission in the area having to do with smelter related contamination. City of Denver has its mission and that it's got to protect public health and the environment. So, uh, and as a PRP, they need to work with EPA on the Superfund portion. If in fact there's a landfill unassociated with smelter activity, well, then that's uh, Denver's problem and then there's got to be something more done there. Um, I don't know that it's been determined completely. I, I don't know. I don't know this landfill is a mystery to me. So I don't really is want to- Is Jesse still this. there, Janine? Is Jesse still on the line? Yes. Jesse, I don't know if you want to address that. <laughs> sure, I can. Um, yeah, the landfill is in the Superfund site. And one of the things that happened is that during the removal work, that water was sampled. So we know some of the water. We also know some, we also know about the constituents of the waste. You know, what is the waste made of? Um, Chuck, Chuck made a point that we don't know, but the reality is that we do know. There was a lot of it that was excavated. So we look at what was in there um, and the same way that we move into the water, uh, the same way that we also sampled the water and then treated it and, dis and discharged it into the river when it was necessary. Um, so we know, you know, that's the whole thing. We know what's in there. Yeah, but is that surface water runoff or is that leaching? No. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
was it min a municipal closed landfill kind of waste or was it, was it super fun related? It was a dump. <laughs> it, it was a hole in the ground, I guess. This is something in the 50s, like Chuck yeah. mentioned. This, That's you know, right. his, you know, landfill is calling it a little bit too close to what we have. They, they didn't have the same regulations back in the 50s. Right. That's um, what we're dealing so, with. Yeah. But so. there are two but, problems, yeah, yeah. two problems, two different sets of regulations, two different sets of responsibility. Well, leachate is a little bit different than, and it has been identified in the past. And so where Chuck is going, which is interesting for me, is you're claiming there's a possibility that if CDPHE is involved, then it is considered municipal, where there was an explosion of the big stack where all the bricks went somewhere. But, you know, where did the waste from the Superfund site go? And it was said that that is a Denver landfill, and you're saying 50s, but the smelter was before the 50s. So there's leachate. How do we identify if it's just the landfill or really waste from the smelter? Leachate's a little different thing as far as the composition of the leachate, what's actually being seen and discharging into the South Platte. So this could provide- so That's just exactly what Jesse just said. Okay, it was, it. it was analyzed and determined to be a municipal dump. Um, so that's municipal waste. And there's, we're not through with OU2 and OU3. So there's still much more to discover about the Superfund site. So, yeah. you know, that's well, we sample a little change there, Janine. Yeah. History tells us that there was a dump, there was slack. And during the removal, the water was sampled. The results, um, Adrian asked for the results. And the results are in the completion report. The CAG right. has Can we see it? Can we see here. them? Hi, this is Adrian. Can we see the results? Uh, right now, I will have to look for it. So it no, I mean, can you can you make can you email them to us? Uh, the the CAG already has the completion report, so they can share that with you. Oh, okay. Just from okay. a couple of years I, ago. I don't think I've seen that. So Jesse, are you saying that this is been identified by EPA, and EPA has determined that that is a municipal dump, and that in fact that is not a Superfund dump, and therefore the leachate that's happening now is from the municipal dump and not from the possibility that it's really not a municipal dump, but there, ha that, but there was contaminants from the smelter operation that were in that dump and not just a municipal dump from the 1950s. I think that Jesse corrected me there. I went on a tangent that was incorrect. And that, that is that contents of the, the, the dump were analyzed and slag was found there. But when we sampled the um, leachate, the effluent coming from that area, it, the, there was not anything, there were no constituents from the Superfund site in that leachate, correct? No, 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 no. No, I'm Simple. still this wrong. Is, still wrong. <laughs> okay, let's try. Still wrong. Jesse, One more time. Jesse, try again. The site, the site was the former smelter area back in the early 1900s. Some point, Denver made that into a municipal dump, closed it in you know, the 50s. So here we are today in a site that had multiple uses. During the removal work, an excavation was done. That excavation showed what was the waste. We sampled the waste. We also had to remove water during that excavation. We sampled the water. So we know, we have information about the quality of the water in there. And we have information about the type of waste that is in there. That, that's all it is. Leachate is the word to describe the water that's um, the liquid that is coming out from a dump. And the idea of the leachate and the clean water, then, you know, this is where things kind of got um, strange there, is that, um, as Chuck mentioned, uh, Chuck observed some water from early from before the channel was working. And Chuck is calling that, that's groundwater as a flooring. So what I'm saying is that if there is an issue of a clean water discharge and clean water discharge in Colorado, I believe, take, it considers also groundwater coming into surface water. That needs to be addressed by CDPHE. A similar situation in which the CAG also mentioned that there could be leachate coming from the site 
and showing on sips, actually the same sips that Chuck showed in one of his slides um, was addressed during the removal by CDPHG. So CDPHG has already looked at this same um, idea and they made a determination. They are the ones that know. And, and like Chuck mentioned, the C CDPHG is the one that managed the, that implementation of the Clean Water Act. So is that why we need to get someone from CDPAG who will deal with the water? Yep. Water. I'm, I'm pretty sure the fund that will be able to find out the person that, you know, came here before and then get, you know, get them to talk to you and tell you what was done then and what can be done now. So we're saying there is leachate that is continuing and there is no permit currently that we're aware of that CDPHE did not identify or present to the CAG yet, but there is leachate that has been identified that is that has either surfaced um, as surface water, groundwater surfacing as surface water be, to become leachate that's being visibly identified. And we do need CDPHE to address leachate that has surfaced and going to the South Platte. Is that what we're saying? No, not at all. Okay, help me. That's good. No, it's just that you keep using leachate. You say that we know that there's leachate coming out and that there is a need to do something. What shock observations say is that there's groundwater coming up at different places from the outfall and from the banks of the river. He's and that they need surfing. to be managed. And they are surfacing, mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So the and groundwater they, that is surfacing, I'm sorry, the leachate that is surfacing from the groundwater or leachate is, is groundwater, can be groundwater. It is surfacing, he's seen it, you've seen it. You're saying that is a CDPHE issue. It is no longer in EPA's um, window as being a part of uh, the municipal dump because that dump is not a Superfund site. But municipalities have landfills that do have leachate that do surface into uh, bodies of water like the South Platte. It just needs to be permitted, it needs to be identified. <laughs> you guys have a question about <laughs> groundwater showing up at surface that needs to be brought to CDPG to figure if it needs a permit. So EPA does not want any part of this. EPA does not believe that has anything to do with this particular OU2 operation at this time. Uh, EPA, let me, EPA, does, EPA does not on, regulate John. Superfund. Oh, hold on, John. Go, Steve. Yeah, uh, let me try to correct some misstatements that are being made here. Um, the, the use of the term leachate, I think it's, um, uh, is a misnomer. It's it's kind of throwing us off base here. Uh, the if we go all the way back to the beginning of this meeting and the review of this investigation plan, the scope of work for revising the remedial investigation, a big portion of that work is to characterize the groundwater. Um, and this is water that's outside of the surface water drainage, uh, which of course you all know the history of and the construction and all of that. So the, the multiple uses that Jesse mentioned um, were, were not um, trying to shift the focus to another agency for that area of OU2 that uh, Denver used as a, a uh, dump uh, for a period of time. It happens to be co-located. It's you know in the area of the former smelter, but it doesn't really matter in the long run um, in terms of if it was smelter, if it was the dump, if there are consequences of that, that all ha Denver has to address all of that in the remedial investigation. So um, I do think it will be helpful to get someone from the state, from CDPHE, from their water division to come and talk about the discharge permit that the city has, which is a stormwater permit. Uh, and they can probably, with a little research, they can look back at the information that we collected 
uh, and by we, I mean Denver, the state, EPA collected during the removal activity, because we do have quite a bit of data from that time. So the, the short answer is it doesn't really matter whether it was the dump or if it was the smelter. We're still looking at those issues. Uh, we're having Denver look at those issues as part of the RI uh, so that, you know, whatever needs to be done will be done. Uh, and, you know, the site ultimately will be left in a state that's con considered protective. So, you know, again, I, I do think the water discussion will be helpful for everybody. Uh, and, you know, we'll, sir, we'll, Jesse and um, Chuck can connect and, you know, follow up on questions that they may have, you know, going back and forth on the comments and we'll clarify that as well. But I just wanted to clarify that, you know, when you use the term leachate, municipal landfill, things like that, that strongly speaks to another regulatory program that is not at play here at all. Uh, so we don't have that other program um, having an active role just because there was a dump, you know, in this particular portion of the Superfund site. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Well, one last question again, is the dump a municipal dump or because you're saying right now, we're not going to identify it as a municipal dump. We're not going to de define it as a Superfund dump. It is a dump. And that's not and, what I said. Okay. That's you got to help me, Steve. Just help me. Is <clears throat> the, the Denver dump considered a Superfund dump? Well, uh, first I'd say there's no such thing as, quote, a Superfund dump. It is part of OU2 of the BBI-70 site. Uh, I don't know how to say it any other way than that. We consider it a portion of the site or having Denver investigate it. And if things need to be done with respect to that, they'll, we'll have them do them. Steve and Jesse, did, uh, yeah. Joan, I think we have, it, it is past 7.30. And we need to, uh, you can continue, you can send them emails and get, get responses and, re and report back to us. We do need to uh, give Denver a chance to speak here since they are a potentially responsible party and are a very large part of this. So um, Fran, if you want to go on and then we do need to have a, a small bit of time for some community. So at this point we will be ending the CAG portion of the meeting. No, we're asking Denver if they have anything to say. And who is Denver? Is there Who's any representing Denver, Agatha or Andrew? We lost you, Bridget, your, your voice is turned off. We invited Denver to come because they're an integral part of this project and yet they have chosen not to attend any CAG meetings for about a year. Um, so if, if the CDPH and EPA have any influence on them, it would be well to ask them to perhaps attend um, our meeting so that we could get clarification from them and communicate the community's concerns to them as well. Thank you. Okay, Adrian, you asked another question. How can we see the results of the water analysis or did you already get that answered? Yeah, uh, Yeah. this is Adrian. Um, yeah, apparently it's uh, part of the, uh, you have, the, the CAG has the results and I guess I didn't get a copy of them, but uh, Jesse was saying that it's a few couple of years old, so I don't know if you can send me a copy. Chuck, can, Chuck has it in his um, uh, library, and so do we. So we will get you a copy. So, yeah, just I mean, I'd just be interested. What, oh no, it's you know, fine. We're we're excited that that people want to read these documents. No, I, well, it may be something I've already. I've had a lot of documents in the last month or two, month or and two. it may be something I've already read. But there was one which had a ton of data in it and it was it was very interesting to see that i think this is the one i wrote a report on was it that one did you guys see the 
I sent a report out a, a, a month or I so back. I think the CDOT report. Uh, Was that, the, okay. Is this, we'll take okay. care of Okay. Okay. And then this uh, sounds like there's another question from somebody. Thank you. So, um, Dennis. I just want to say that I remember that site when I was in high school. And I used to ride my bike over to Globeville and my friends and I would walk through and I, I guess I could be hypnotized and try to dredge up what was found, we found there. I mostly remember Victorian bedsteads, if I remember correctly. Uh, but again, I, I, I'm just going here, I remember. But there was a lady who lived right, oh, right about where, just a little bit beyond where um, the uh, Globeville Landing is. And I think her name was Annie Machuga. And she always distracted us. Whenever we'd come over, she would chat with us and say that Martians had taken her up in a Martian machine and uh, were trying to kidnap her and take her away from Globeville. And uh, all my friends said, she's just living too close to the dump. That's what happens when that, that dump gets you. But anyway, I, I just think it's interesting, but if it's true, if we find out that radium is coming up through the water and uranium, that uh, I know Denver loves to say how wonderful the fish are jumping high as an aspen tree along the Platte River now. And uh, I think there should be a sign and maybe uh, Councilwoman, uh, uh, Candy can uh, get a sign up. I haven't seen any of the signs lately, but in the summertime, it gets so hot. I see a lot of kids uh, wading down along the confluence and they come out and usually throw up right there on the side of the river because the, the water is so bad. But uh, shouldn't there be a warning not to go wading? I just thought I'd throw that out and I'll send it to Bridget as a as a question because I don't know how to uh, finish the chat. That's all. <laughs> okay. So Dennis, you would like there to be signage to indicate the, that the water is not fit for- Well, I just, uh, I, if we find out that there, there are things in the water that are inappropriate for children, 